Good evening, everybody. Shalom. Thank you for coming. Tonight, our topic is Passover, the Lazarus phenomenon. It's that time of year again. You can just kind of feel it. Passover is around the corner. It's about three weeks away at this point. And in Yeshua's time, also, there was a buzz in the weeks and certainly during the days right before Passover. And the largest reason for that was because of Lazarus, because of what happened with Lazarus, whose real name was Elazar. I'm just going to use his more commonly known name tonight, Lazarus. And Yeshua raised him from the dead after being four days gone and wrapped up in grave clothes in a tomb. It was one of the great miracles that he did, great signs that he did. And uh, it was because of this that the stage was set. A, that the ruling religious establishment wanted to put him to death. B, that the people hailed him as Messiah. So there was this phenomenon as Passover approached and as Yeshua entered into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, people hailed him as Messiah, crowds gathered, and this was largely because of what had happened with Lazarus. The people who actually witnessed it went around Jerusalem and told the story of what they had seen. So the whole matter grew and grew. Now, I'm going to talk about that in some more detail tonight, but uh, first I would like to just sort of lay a foundation here so it will help you understand what this is all about. The, um, one of the great statements from the Torah, uh, one of the great statements from Scripture in general, is this statement, I am that I am. I am that I am. And, and we get that from the Torah. And it was actually God's response to Moses when God called Moses at the burning bush. And Moses replied to the Lord, you know, um, what am I to do if the children of ask, or excuse me, if the children of Israel ask me, what is the name of this God who sent you? And, and God told uh, Moses, you're to say to them, I am has sent you. I am has sent you. And, and uh, prior to that, he had said to Moses, I am that I am. So, when Israel asks who sent you, tell them, I am sent you. And in reality, uh, Moses never, he never used this. I mean, he certainly grasped it. He certainly understood it. And this was vital to who Moses was in the Lord, as it is for you and me, by the way. But Moses never explained this or told this to the children of Israel and for obvious reasons because it would have sounded ridiculous it would have seemed preposterous to them so God also told Moses uh, that he should say the God of your fathers has sent me Adonai yod heh vav -Hey, the God of your fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob that is something that they could more relate to knowing that the God who sent Moses is the same God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could relate to that generally. They could understand it generally. But the point is that they didn't understand this God who sent Moses. They only knew that he was the God of their fathers, but they didn't know him. They knew who he was historically. They knew that he was Abraham's God. They knew he was Isaac and Jacob's God. They knew that he had sent Moses, but they did not know him. And Moses did. 
And who is this God? I am. I am that I am. And it sounds as ridiculous to you and me as it would have sounded if Moses had tried to explain that to the Israelites. And yet this is this is the truth. This is the truth of God's nature. This is the truth of who God is. God is. God is. This is his nature. This is his essence. This is his being. He is. And in saying he is, it's a way of saying that he's the one and only. If God is, then there's nothing else that is. And everything else is not. Every, now, that sounds a little bit preposterous too, doesn't it? But it's not. It's the, it's the essence of the whole thing. And I'm going to show you how this connects to the incident with Lazarus. And this is the core of Messiah Yeshua's teaching. There's one God who is. There's one God who is the I am. And he's the I am of all things that are. He's the one and only life. That's why Yeshua said, I am the truth. I am the way, I am the life. We see again and again him teaching, I am the life. Before Abraham was, I am. And so uh, if there's one God, which is, then everything else is not. So everything else is nothing because Something that's here today and gone tomorrow is nothing. It's temporary. It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. Nothing can exist unless it's eternal. And eternity exists not just in the future, as is commonly thought when people think of heaven. They think of, oh, I'm going to die and go to heaven, then, then I'll come to into eternity as if it starts then. Eternity is from the beginning, from before the beginning, there is no beginning with eternity. And to the end, there is no end either. It's infinite. It's hard for us to even conceptualize. And this is the nature of God, and this is who Mashiach Yeshua was. And this is what he taught. Not just that he was that, but that we too are formed of the same I am which he was, the same spirit that raised him from the dead is is in us, the breath that's in our nostrils. As the Torah says, man was formed from the dust of the earth and God breathed in the Shemat Chaim, the breath of life into his nostrils. The breath that's in our nostrils is the life. The breath, we are nothing. We're from the dust, we return to dust, but the breath that is within us is eternal life. The life that is within us is the I am, is the same I am that Moses knew is the same I am that Yeshua was in perfection. And this is the key to the rabbi's teaching. And note that Yeshua, he is the savior. This is one of his, his offices, you know, prophet, king. But he's also a teacher, rabbi. And I think in the Christian world, he's more well known at, in his capacity as savior. And then this is not to minimize that role at all. He is the savior of mankind. He is the lamb who died for the sins of the world. He is the hope of mankind. He did pay the penalty for our sins, but it's more than that. He's more than that. He also was a teacher. He was a rabbi and he taught us not just to identify him but he taught us to know what he knew. He taught us to be what he was, that we too might be children of God with him, heirs, joint heirs of the riches of the kingdom of God, together with him who is the firstborn who went before us. He's the perfect son of God. There's no doubt there's only one Yeshua. But you see, he didn't teach us to just identify him. He taught us to be what he was, which was a child of God. Not that we can ever be equal to him, but 
we're called, if we belong to him, to be sons and daughters of the Lord. And this is, as I said, the essence of his teaching. But not many people got it. Um, in the generation of Moses, Moses understood this. And the whole generation witnessed the greatest signs and wonders and miracles of any generation. Manna from heaven, water from a rock, the opening of the Red Sea. They didn't understand who God was. Moses did. A couple of others. Uh, Yeshua said, before Abraham was, I am. Identifying with the same I am that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. And he told us, I'm going away because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come to you. He wanted us who belong to him as followers, as Messiah followers, he wanted us to, to be children of God. He wanted us to know what he knew. Greater things than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. This is what he taught. He taught us to do the works that he did. And I'm not saying that we are doing those works. Not right now, anyway. We're on our way. Hopefully, we're, we're, uh, we should be seeking to do that. We should be doing, doing some of those works. It's a, it's a question of degree when we talk about the works that he was speaking of. You know, those were the... Um, so-called supernatural works, so he never called them that because they're really not supernatural, but the so-called supernatural really should be natural in the Messiah. But the Shlachim, the apostles, certainly walked in that kind of authority because they, why were they able to do it? Why were they able to do what we 2,000 years ago are just learning? We're just starting to, to get there and what was the difference? The difference is they grasped his teaching. Again, he was a rabbi. They, in terms of his capacity as the Savior, they didn't know anything special about that that we don't know. He was the Lamb of God, died for the sins of the world, was crucified, rose on the third day, ascended up to heaven. We know all that, too. The difference is that he taught them something. He taught something. It's there in the scriptures. After he rose, there was only 500 that saw him in Galilee. Why not 500,000? Why not the whole nation? Good gracious, if Yeshua showed up right now, I would think, you know, he could at least fill a stadium. But I don't know. <laughs> he rose from the dead and... Uh, there was only 500 who really got it. Everybody else thought he was dead and gone. So anyway, um, you talk about the numbers of people in the world um, who consider themselves believers in him, 2.2 billion. There's 2.2 billion so-called followers of the Messiah or Christ, if you prefer, 2.2 billion and most of them are no different than the generation that was with Moses. Most of them don't understand the core of his teaching. That's why he said that the, uh, the way is straight and the gate is narrow. The way is straight and the gate is narrow. It's the, it's the way is difficult and narrow. And, but he wasn't talking about... Um, Atonement, that's easy. It's easy for your sins to be forgiven. Just believe in him. Believe he died for your sins. Believe by his stripes you're healed. The penalty of your peace was placed upon him. For the Father placed upon him the iniquity of us all. All, all that you see in Isaiah 53. That's easy. Anybody, anybody who believes can receive that, and, and God made it that way. He made it nice and easy. But to walk in the rabbi's teaching, to be B'nai Elohim, sons and daughters of the Lord, the way is straight, 
and the gate is narrow. The gate is straight and the way is narrow. And but it's there. And and this is Messianic Judaism's calling. This is the calling of Messianic Jews and those from the nations who are clinging to Israel in these times. There's an apostolic calling upon us in these end times. These are the end of days and God is pouring out his spirit on Jewish people. Suddenly we're coming back proclaiming Yeshua as the Messiah, that he died on Passover, was raised on the third day, ascended up to heaven, poured out his spirit. And there was a whole generation that raised the dead, that healed the sick, spoke in tongues and other languages, really. And they spoke prophetically. And the prophet Joel said, your sons and daughters will prophesy. The old men will dream dreams, the young men will see visions. All of these things are ordained and they're just beginning to happen. The way is being prepared for Messiah's return. But what happened with Lazarus? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my Bible out here. I hope that's still loud. <laughs> We usually pull them up on computers and cell phones. So, so if you're sitting at home and you don't have a Bible, maybe you'll want to open your cell phone or your computer to John 11. If not, just follow along. But that's where this whole incident is described. Uh, this amazing thing that happened that caused a phenomenon. Now, if at some point you'd like to ask a question, if you're participating, and you've registered, you can submit a question to me in the question box, I'll try to get to it. Otherwise, I'm just gonna preach on. John 11, uh, it tells us that um, in verse four, when Yeshua heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory, so that Ben Elohim, which is the son of God, may be glorified through it. Now, Yeshua loved Martha and her sister. Her sister, by the way, was Miriam. This was the same Miriam or Mary that uh, anointed Yeshua's feet and wiped her tears off of his feet with her hair. Anyway, um, he loved this family. Apparently, they were close. And however, when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. That was strange. He's going all over the nation, healing the sick and raising the dead. Why doesn't he skedaddle from where he was to go and be with Lazarus? There are multiple ideas about that. One um, is that uh, he'd been run out of Judea earlier. And it's, it's all described in John 10 because of some statements that he had made, uh, some teachings that he had given that were very controversial. And um, one of them that they wanted to stone him for, I'm, I'm reading from John 10, um, verse, excuse me, verse uh, 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Woo, that's, you know, what's he talking about? I give eternal life to my sheep. You know, this was hard for the religious establishment to hear this kind of thing. Um, he says in, in verse 29, my father has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. And he had previously taught in John 10, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. He's talking like he is the source of eternal life. Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to read uh, one more thing he got in trouble for in John 10, but I want to say a quick word about eternal life. Eternal life, as we understand it in Judaism, and this was certainly true in the time of the rabbi, is not something that that happens when you go after you die and go to heaven, okay? Eternal life, in the Jewish view, is an ever-present reality. Eternal life is not a future event. Eternal life is a present 
tense reality, a present tense possession. And Chaye Olam, as it's called, is, as I said earlier in, in this class, is only possible through the one principle, the one abiding truth of the universe, which is God. There's one God and God is. Everything else is changing. Here today, gone tomorrow. Here today, gone tomorrow. A tree might live 300 years. Men used to live 900 years. Now we don't live that long. You know, God willing, you live to be 100 and me too. That's a good long life. I'll sign up for that right now. But still, 100 years, 1,000 years, it's nothing. You're here today, gone tomorrow. Anything that's here today, gone tomorrow is nothing. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is eternality. And eternality exists only in the Lord. That's why he said that to Moses, I am. And he said, I am that I am. So uh, this is expressed so beautifully in the New Testament scripture, which says that God is, God is all and is in all. He is all and is in all. Paul also said, we live and move and have our being in God. He's the truth. He's the eternal one. He's the, the I am, not, not only um, of himself, but of us also. Because in each and every one of us is the eternal presence of the Lord. This is the image in which we're fashioned. This is the breath in our nostrils. This is the eternal life. This is the immortal presence. And at some time when mortality puts on immortality, we become conscious. Consciousness is revelation. It's like awakening from a dream, a bad dream, really. When suddenly we realize that this life is an illusion. This life is a dream. But the true, the life, which Yeshua said, I am the life. I am the life. This is the eternal from the beginning to the end, the first and the last, and so forth, and the one and only. And so he's saying this stuff, you know, about giving eternal life, that there's eternal life through him. I've come to give life and give it abundantly. They didn't like that because it sounds like he's saying he's God, which he was. But you see, he also taught that the same eternal presence that was in him that same eternal presence that same eternal spirit that was in him that was raising the dead healing the sick ultimately raised him that ultimately he would direct it so that we too might live by that same presence that we might become conscious also of that ruach hakodesh holy spirit whether we call the presence of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Mashiach, um, or, or the Father. There's, there's one God. These are uh, concepts. These are attempts to describe different angles. But there's one God. Now, um, Yeshua also taught that and he, he got in big trouble about this just before this thing happened with Lazarus. He, he's, he's in John 10 here. He says, um, as they start accusing him of blasphemy, uh, he quotes Psalm 82, 6. Yeshua, Yeshua answered them, isn't it written in your writings? I have said to you that you are gods, Elohim. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, 
the one the Father set apart and sent into the world. You speak blasphemy because I said I am the Son of God. So he's saying, you're saying that I'm blaspheming by saying I'm the Son of God, but it says right here in the scriptures in Psalm 82, 6, God was saying, I said you are Elohim. I, I said you are children of the Most High, B'nai Elyon. Now, unfortunately, not only in, in his time, but today also, um, you better not quote Psalm 82, 6, because people always take it the wrong way. And the reason for that is there's so much abuse when it comes to that scripture. There's people out there saying that you're little gods or you're little Christ or something like that. And that is a bunch of bogus nonsense. There's nothing about you or me as humans that can ever be divine. But what the rabbi taught, being a rabbi, being a teacher, he was also God's perfect son. He was also the savior. He was also a prophet, king, son of David. But he was also a rabbi. What he was teaching was that through me, you too are children of God. You too are B'nai Elohim. And we see this point again and again throughout the New Testament. Paul taught it. Read Romans 8. There's, there's a, you get a good dose of it there sometime. But he was trying to help us to, to be in this relationship where it's not, it's not like... Um, the Lord is this far off being of corporeal nature up in, in the sky somewhere or something, but that we would understand that we as, as um, Messiah followers, grasping his Torah, his teaching, and I mean Yeshua's, Yeshua's teaching, Yeshua's Torah, which is the core of the Torah of Moses, but Yeshua's Torah, that's written upon our hearts, the Torah written upon our hearts, that through this, the whole idea of his ministry was to help us to become B'nai Elohim, children of God. Now, most people didn't get it. Most people uh, still don't get it. But, you know, if, if you believe in him, then your sins are forgiven. And that's, that's where it starts. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have that because without that, you're not getting anywhere anyway. But there's more. There's more. And, and by more, I mean there's deliverance from the power of death. And with that, deliverance from poverty, deliverance from depression, deliverance from anxieties and fears. There's deliverance from sickness and disease. This is how it was that the apostles healed the sick and raised the dead and, and prospered and had grace to do what they'd been commissioned to do, even though it was against all odds, and they were massively successful, excuse me, in everything that they did uh, because they grasped the Messiah's teachings. They understood what he was teaching. And it's, it's never demonstrated more clearly than in this inf incident with Lazarus, except one other time. And that's when he himself raised from, was raised from the dead. And I'll talk about that more uh, next time. But I, I still haven't gotten deep enough into John 11, the, the incident with Lazarus. So here it is. Uh, he stays, 11-6. He heard Lazarus was sick. He stayed where he was for two more days. Why didn't he just skedaddle and scurry over there? I'm going to explain why he didn't. But let's read on a little bit here, okay? Uh, you, you skip down here to verse 14, John eleven fourteen. 14. Yeshua told them clearly, Lazarus is dead. I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there so that you may believe. Now let's go to him. So now he's going to go there. But he says, I'm glad I wasn't there. Lazarus is dead. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, think of it. If he was there, he would have healed Lazarus. Everyone would have been saying, Lazarus is sick. He's got a fatal illness. Heal him. And he would have, he would have done it. But now there's, a, there's some opportunity. He sees some opportunity in this crisis. Uh, and I think it's obvious that he certainly could have gone there couple days earlier when he first heard about it. So he 
is obviously letting this situation develop, but it's not as I think is often thought that he's just doing this kind of sarcastically, like, ha, 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 I'll just let Lazarus be dead for four days and I'll go show them all. It's, it's, not, a, it's not exactly that kind of a thing, okay? But let's, um, let's press on here. And you see that when Yeshua arrives in this, in this city, it's called Bethany, uh, which was just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem, that uh, Martha, who was one of the two sisters, she heard that Yeshua was coming. She went out to meet him, while the other sister, Miriam, stayed in the house. And the first thing she says to him, verse 21, Martha says, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. True. And he could have been there, but he wasn't. And, you know, it, it's often thought maybe he didn't come because of what had happened earlier, as described in John 10, where they were going to stone him back in Judea. I don't think that's it, because he, you know, he never really feared that. He knew when it was his time that that was going to come. You know, sometimes they'd crowd around him to stone him and he'd escape. That couldn't have been what it was. But if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. True. And Yeshua says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And again, as I said earlier, chaye olam, eternal life, is not a future event. And this is what the rabbi expresses in his response to that when she says, I know he's going to rise on the last day in the resurrection. Uh, and he makes it clear that's not what I'm talking about. And he says to her, Anochi. Hatikuma, I am the resurrection. Anuchi, I. And that's emphatic when you say Anuchi, not Ani, which also means I, but Anuchi means I, like I went to the store. You know, it's emphatic. And I'll give you an example. I'll do a little, a little journey here to Isaiah 43, verse 11. Listen to this. Anochi, Anochi, Adonai, I, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. I alone declared, saved, and proclaimed not some foreign God among you. So you are my witnesses. It is a declaration of Adonai, and I am God. So Isaiah is expressing, Anochi, Anochi, I, I am the Lord. I, this Savior. Who is this I that he's talking about? Who is this Anochi? Anochi, Anochi, Adonai. Who is Anochi? I am God. From verse 13, from eternity I am he. No one can deliver from my hand. I act and who can reverse it? And that's what Yeshua was teaching in John 10. You're my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. No one can snatch you out of my hand. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the savior. I've come to give life. I've come to bring life and to bring it abundantly. Um, again, in Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am the one who blots out. Anochi, anochi. It's double emphatic again. Anochi, anochi. I am the one who blots out your transgression for my own sake. Wait a minute. I thought Yeshua died at the tree for the atonement to blot out our transgressions. Exactly. This I that Isaiah speaks of, that in Isaiah 53, he says, by his stripes were healed. This I is the I that Yeshua was. Anochi, Anochi, Adonai, I, I am the Lord. This is the I that said to Moses, I am. I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you. But he didn't know how to explain it because it sounds ridiculous. It sounds esoteric. People don't want esoteric. They want something, you know, put it on, put it on my plate, put it in my pocket, give it to me. <laughs> but 
but Yeshua was an esoteric teacher. This is the land of Israel. It's the East. It's the Eastern world. That's the way he taught. He taught like the Eastern masters. If you're familiar with Talmud at all, you see this is the way the rabbis taught. They made you think. They made you contemplate, take scripture, chew on it, contemplate, meditate, sit and wait on the Lord. This is the kind of thing that he did, his apostles did, he taught them to do. Know the I that he was. This is what he meant when he said in John 14, 20, I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. It's the I that he was perfectly Anochi in Hebrew. Anochi, Anochi. I, I am the Savior. I am God. I am the one who blots out your transgressions that he came to connect us to, bring us into communion to. All of this was accomplished at Passover, and he begins to demonstrate it most vividly here with his friend Eleazar, Lazarus. And as he says back to Martha, when she says, I know he's going to rise from the dead on the last day, he says, I am the resurrection. Anochi hatikuma, hatikuma, the, the rising, you know, um, uh, tikuma, like talita uh, kumi, uh, he said to the little kumi, which means rise, kumi ori, rise and shine. Hatikuma, the rising, hachayim, the light. I am that, he's saying, the I that I am. But it's not just the eye that he is. He is. He was perfect. He was perfect in that respect. We're not. Never will be. But still, he taught us to. He taught us that that the true nature of our being is the same being that he was. He goes before us. He was perfect. He was the perfect lamb without sin, without blemish. That's why he was able to die for our sins. But he didn't just die for our sins. He taught us the way of eternal life. The way of eternal life, the eternal ever-present reality is not just identifying theologically who he was and knowing the historical facts of, of what he did. But the living, breathing presence that lives within us. This is the truth and the way and the life of the universe that was, is, and is to come. Without end, without beginning, this is eternal life. And it's an ever-present reality, if only we'll open our eyes to it. The kingdom of heaven, or excuse me, the kingdom of God is within you. This is what uh, Yeshua taught. So he says, I'm the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, referring to the same me, the same Anuchi or I that Isaiah spoke of, that is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, who blots out the, the transgressions and sins as well, and is the Savior. Whoever believes in, in that me, or you could say it another way, who knows who Yeshua really is, as Peter did when, when he said to his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Oh, they say you're Elijah. They say you're Jeremiah. They say you're a great prophet. They didn't get it. The masses didn't get it. Peter got it when he said, Ata b'nei Elohim ha-Mashiach, when you are the Son of God, the Messiah. But he wasn't just making an identification, he truly saw who Yeshua was, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Peter saw that he was God, he saw that, and, and nobody else did at that point, but Peter lost it also. <laughs> and then when the Lord rose from the dead, he understood and he was able to go forward. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So if you live and believe in me, you will never die. Never die. 
How is that? Because eternal life is a present tense reality. That's how, and that's why. And she says, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Messiah. Ben Elohim, who has come into the world. But I don't think she really got it. And now you see uh, that Yeshua meets up with Miriam. She comes out of the house and she is weeping at his feet. She falls at his feet saying, again, Master, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. We heard that already, didn't we? Uh, so she says it too. And when Yeshua saw her weeping, and the Judeans who came with her were weeping, he was deeply troubled in spirit and himself agitated. Now we start to see him get troubled and agitated. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Back before when he first heard Lazarus was sick, he didn't do anything. He just hung around where he was, even when he found out that he had died. He said, you know, stuff like this is this is all for the for for God to be glorified. He didn't weep. He didn't get agitated or troubled when he heard that his friend had died. It was like, you know, he looked at it like he knew this was supposed to happen, that kind of thing. But now he sees something and he realizes something. I'm going to tell you what that something is. But let's let's read on here. Where have you laid him? Verse 34. Come and see, master. They tell him, and Yeshua wept. Now he's weeping. And the, the Jewish people who were there that were watching this said, you see how he loved him? You see, he's weep as if he's weeping because he loved Lazarus. Well, how come he wasn't weeping earlier when he heard about it? This is the crux of the thing right here. He's not weeping because he loved Lazarus. He knows darn well what's about to happen. He knows he's about to bring Lazarus back. He knows it. Why would he weep if he knows that's going to happen? He'd be smiling, if anything. He's weeping for another reason. He's troubled for another reason. Some of them said, couldn't this one who opened the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? Good question. Didn't they say the same thing when he was on the cross? You saved others. Why can't you save yourself? He could have. He was trying to do something for them. And it, it's kind of the same thing they're saying. You, you healed all these people. Couldn't you have kept your friend from dying? Verse 38, so Yeshua was deeply troubled within himself. He's troubled. He's agitated. He's crying, weeping. Why? What incident in the New Testament, does this remind you of? I'll tell you if you can't think of it. The Garden of Gethsemane, when he's on his last night and he knows what he's going to have to go and do. And he doesn't want to do it, but he knows he has to. And that's why he's troubled. That's why he's agitated. And that's why he's weeping. It's not for Lazarus, but it's because now he knows that they're not getting it. And he's going to bring Lazarus back. But they should have been able to do it. That's why he stayed behind. They should have. If they understood his teaching, they should have been able to heal Lazarus. They should have been able to raise him from the dead, even if need be. He's trying to teach his followers, do the works that I do. And they did some. But they never really could until afterwards, after he died and rose and ascended. That's when the thing really caught fire. But he didn't want to have to go to the tree and suffer miserably the way he did. Well, of course he didn't want to have to do that. But herein, in this incident, he knows he's going to have to because everybody thinks the master has to be here so that Lazarus won't die. And what did he say? It's expedient for you that I go away, otherwise the comforter won't come. The comforter will come because I go unto my father. You can't always be expecting me to come and do all this stuff. I want you to do these works. 
the works that I do, you will do. Even greater works than these you will do. And it was true in that generation. You know, I, I'm not hamming it up. I'm not saying that we're, we are doing those works right now. And, and it's all relative. In a lesser way, in some way we are. And in some way we, we may not even know to what extent. But it's not the extent of the apostles generation right now but we're getting there we should be getting there we should be pushing and learning and striving to get to learn to to be what yeshua called us to be which is sons and daughters of the lord well the um the thing is he realizes that this is never going to happen unless he goes to the tree dies for the sins of the world he demonstrates that he is the life. Death has no power over him because he's fully God. He's fully conscious. He's fully in the awareness of the one eternal God, which is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, he was the son of that God in perfection. But nobody got it. And he had to go to the tree and suffer. And in this incident, he realizes it and he knows it. And he raises Lazarus and the Lazarus phenomenon ensues. And so it was uh, when he entered Jerusalem, the people were going crazy. It was Passover, and everybody heard about what he'd done. So I'm going to, next week, I'm going to pick up there and talk more about the, the weeks before Passover, or excuse me, the week before Passover and the events that uh, took place. But I appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, I hope that you were inspired. I was just by sharing with you. I hope you were uplifted and it gives you something in the middle of this week to bring the light of Messiah into your life. As you can see, I've got this ridiculous um, balloon behind me. It says, happy birthday. <laughs> that was not an accident. It was my birthday uh, just a couple days ago. So I thought I'd leave it. The synagogue gave it to me, and I just love it. I like the colors. But anyway, um, if you'd like to um, send in a blessing to bless the ministry, you can do that, templenj.org. Now, we certainly do appreciate it and encourage it. Thank you for being here, and I hope to see you next week. Shalom, Lila Tov.